What's up my dream comrades and welcome to the Beverage Click podcast dedicated to discussions surrounding beverages with an Asian perspective. I'm your host Sean O, co-founder of the Beverage Click Academy which is based in Singapore. Now this is a monumental episode as it is our first podcast episode and to commemorate that we have a very special guest today that's actually also responsible for our jingle intro and outro, a very talented musician himself. Uh, I've known him for quite a while now, ever since the conception of the Beverage Click uh, six years ago. He's a fellow Beverage Click alumnus, highly decorated if I may add, and um, uh, he's an advanced sake professional recognized by the Sake Educational Council of Japan. He's a international Kiki Sake Shi that's uh, part of the SSI and a certified Sake Sommelier conferred by the Sake Sommelier Association. He is a director of uh, a premium sake distribution company that has been featured in publications like the Singapore Tatler, The Edge, China News Asia, Mr. Otaro himself, Eugene Wong. Hey Eugene, how's it going man? Hey, hi Sean. Very, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, this, is, this is quite exciting. This is a new experience. So thank you. Yeah, believe me, it's it's a new experience for for, for us as well because it's, it is our first uh, podcast, and you know what we're trying to do here is really trying to to spread the word of beverages uh, and one none other than you know true to our hearts, which is Japanese sake. So you know we're gonna we're gonna keep it casual, and and what's gonna happen is that we're gonna um, have a couple of discussions on a few topics that are well, I wouldn't say rather burning, but it's it's it is quite is quite relevant uh, in our current climate. Uh, so first and foremost, we're going to talk about sake trends okay, in Singapore. Uh, sake trends in Singapore and you know, you being a, a kind of like a linchpin in, in the sake uh, industry in our local scene, I'm sure you know quite a bit and you know what's actually happening uh, in, in, on the grounds. So what do you think in terms of sake trends? Um, what, you know, what's actually happening in the market? What do you think is, is popular? You know, let, let us know of your opinion. Sure. Um, first off, I, I don't think I'm a linchpin. <laughs> uh, kingpin, I, I, kingpin. <laughs> no, no way. No way near to that. I'm, I'm still still very new uh, to the market, very small. Um, I, I try to do what I can do, but, uh, you know, still still, still a long way to go from, from some of the big boys out there. You, you guys know who you are. Um, so, uh, you know, t- to be honest, I've, I've been doing this since about... Uh, 2016, 2017. So that's when we we started the business. Um, so you know that's what I can tell you. You know the, the changes I've seen since then, which is about what is it now six six years. Um, I think when I started, it was it was very clear that there were uh, a small amount of brands that uh, customers were interested in. Uh, it was these a very small handful and a very uh, very, to a certain extent, a very similar taste profile that everyone is looking for. Um, and what I can say is, at least in the last three years, um, we've seen a lot of um, experimentation, a lot of adventure from, from consumers. They are willing to try uh, different things, different flavors, different styles. Um, I, I think probably the, the single biggest thing would be... Um, that when we first started, everyone was only interested in Junmai Daiginjo. And that was, you know, I, I think that's how we all started, myself included. But, but these days, I, I find customers actually telling me that they actually prefer, for example, a, a Junmai Genjo, or they actually prefer something that has a little bit more texture, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more flavor, uh, and, you know, a little bit more funk. You know, sometimes that's actually what they're looking for. Uh, and I think that's that's a really interesting uh, uh, movement or a trend even, and and I think we can attribute that actually to some of the the restaurants that themselves are more adventurous with with offering these things to their to their customers, uh, and uh, and I think a lot of things a lot of it actually really depends on the 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 staff themselves you know whether they're a sommelier or or just a waiter or or, or the restaurant manager. You know, who are actually willing to, to tell customers, you know, try this, this is different. Um, you know, you, you really might enjoy this. Yeah. Well, it's good that you brought those, those points. And, you know, I actually have two, two further questions uh, that I'd like to expand on that. One would be, 
in terms of restaurants, you think um, is there a particular style that is tagged on to maybe a fine dining international restaurant or something that's a lot more localized? Um, and uh, will you know will will these styles be continue? You know, will they continue their pop, uh, popularization if there's such a word? Um, what do you what do you think? I, well, to be honest, again, very small sample group, um, and anecdotal to 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 be fair, I think a lot of the the sake that ends up on a sake menu in a restaurant really depends on the chef and the chef and owner, or mm. at least whoever is helping to put the the menu together. Good point. Because yeah. it really revolves around their personal flavor and taste, because. If they enjoy it and they like it, they they will push it more often. You know, they will help to move the sales because it it benefits them as well. You know, they enjoy it and they uh, and they think that it pairs well with their food and their cuisine. So I think that would be probably a higher priority uh, more than more than anything else because customers come to their restaurant with a particular style of food expectation and right? expectations yeah and and then they put the sake together that they will match that food uh, and at the same time it's because you know they like it so um, of course you know most people would have a, a, a wide range on your menu or try to appease you know most customers but I, I see that lean towards uh, you know what they enjoy uh, and then of course they're excited and then they're, they're very excited then when they like it to to introduce these sakes to their customers. Yeah, I agree. And I, I do see a lot of uh, fine dining restaurants these days that are starting to, to, to pound on more and more sakes on the menu, mm-hmm. you know, to, to do sake flights. So that's very encouraging. Um, but that being said, I mean, fine dining ultimately is, well, if, you could, if you could imagine, it's a little bit more light and delicate. And to give a little bit more context to our, our listeners, um, broadly speaking, you know, we have things like your very clean, dry, nigata styles, uh, tanre karakuchi styles that, um, you know, are very fairly light. And you have those very aromatic fruit bombs, you know, that uh, are very juicy and sweet. Uh, and also those very quirky and funky styles. Now, do you think will 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 uh, styles like the quirky and funky ones work for fine dining? Probably it will, but again, it's got to be in the right context where it's introduced and the uh, the guests and customers are ready and expecting, okay, this is going to taste different. This is not the sake that I'm familiar with or that I would normally get. Um, but the good thing about fine dining, or at least most fine dining situations, is that they can introduce to them by the glass. Or you know, it comes as part of a, a tasting or a pairing menu, where uh, where the sake is paired with a particular dish, and they're ready and expect it, and whether they like it or not, you know, it's it's one serving. Mm. It's a little bit more difficult when somebody has to buy a bottle, and uh, you yeah. know, there was there was this big joke with one of the one of the local songs, You know, sometimes customers order, and it's seven hundred and twenty mil of disappointment, <laughs> so, and then it's hard to recover from that. <laughs> yeah, I totally appreciate that, that fact. Um, that's true, and I think largely is also depending depending on what you've mentioned, the sommelier's job to actually you know to make the right kind of recommendation. Right. Uh, but you know, yes, in fine dining restaurants, I think that that will, will be far lesser because you already have a sommelier that's that's you know that's that, that's uh, on site. Uh, but you know what? Let's move away from such a new uh, a niche trend. Uh, because in fine dining it will be a very different story altogether. What about the broader or the you know the, the larger population? What do you think the current trend is? Uh, are we are we moving towards a cleaner style or do you think we you know we're moving towards the other spectrum that's a lot more funky and fruity? Um I th- I think it's uh, I wouldn't say funky and fruity, but I, I see at least for my my portfolio of sakes um, I see a lot of interest in the ones that have a little bit more flavor and texture, um, not necessarily uh, a fruit bomb in that respect, but not the super clean and clear. I mean, there's definitely a market for that, but there is more interest now in the ones that have, have texture, a little bit of story, 
uh, and even just you know a nice gen generic way is that there's a little bit more interest now in omachi compared to mm, something uh, more flavorful, the very right? classic Yamada Nishiki flavor that a lot of people are very used to. Um, I see a lot, I actually get a few customers going out, oh, this is Omachi, I'd like to try that. And that's something that I never saw, you know, four or five years ago. Right, so there is a shift in the market, I suppose. Um, you know, I think for, for when, when did you start with, with sake? Was it more clean, you know, or, or was it more flavorful? So, um, no, it was uh, actually the, the excitement started with uh, Nama. It oh, was that, okay. That massive uh, explosion of, of flavors. That's when I, that's when I went. Wow, this this is something different, and that was uh, the very first Nama I ever tasted. Right, right. So yeah, so I think Nama actually kind of, kind of gets to people in a, in a good way, obviously. Um, and I think for most international people, like I you know, just be just generally, generally people outside of uh, of Japan, they tend to appreciate that quite a bit. Yeah, I, I recall the fact when when I was uh, visiting as a sake student, you know, and, and visiting breweries, and nobody was spitting because it was all nama. It was so hard to get out of a uh, proper a proper nama out of uh, of Japan. Yeah, I was I was you know gulping every every single drop. Yeah, so I think I can fully appreciate what you what you're talking about. Um, to give again to give more context to, to to the listeners about what a clean style would be like would be like a Niigata style sake mm -hmm. and, and, and its popularity was more uh, associated back in the, what, what was it, in 80, was it in the 80s? I would say late 80s. There was a big marketing push from Niigata as, as a region, right? So it was, it was sake, it was their rice, uh, they were pushing, I think there were some of their, uh, some of their food products as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, a yeah. whole uh, prefectural push to, to increase the profile of Niigata outside Exactly, of exactly. And, and again, because of technology, you know, with the whole uh, uh, vertical polishing that was, uh, you know, being refined, so that kind of became a, a style that defined a small a couple of years at least, a, yeah. a couple of decades. Um, I personally, uh, you know, if I'm going to contribute to a little bit of the topic, I think what I do see the trend right now is more of those um, Muroka Nama Genshus. It tends to be the, you know, that top, tends to be form, uh, that tends to form the preference of most uh, consumers here. Do you have a lot of uh, Muroka Nama Genshu in your, in your portfolio? Muroka Genshus, yes. Um, right now I don't have a lot of Nama uh, for logistical reasons. Yeah, 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 logistics is a bitch. Uh, we're allowed to swear on, on, yeah, on, on streaming. Yeah, uh, yeah you're, quite, you're quite right. Um, uh, I think, again, we probably have to do another separate podcast for, 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 for topics and uh, subject matters like uh, what is a Muruka, what is a Nama, what is a Genshu. But that is the, you know, that is kind of the, the, the one that to look for, you know, look, to look out for in terms of um, big and bold. It's kind of, it kind of reminds me of like your Napa cap, you know, back in right. the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so okay, I, I think that's, uh, that's, those are a couple of good points for, for sake trends that are in Singapore right now. Um, do you think in terms of e-commerce, um, what would be, I'm, I'm not sure if, how, how involved you are in e-commerce, but which, which type of sake will actually move a little bit more? What do you think? Right. Um, yeah, we've we've got a site and that's been uh, doing you know pretty all right since uh, since, since COVID started. Um, I think what what has worked out well on online um, is actually a little bit of a mix of uh, <laughs> honestly of of uh, photography and write up mm -hmm. because most people uh, you know we're not there to talk to them. To, to introduce the sake to them. So it's, it's really about what, how we introduce, introduce the sake to them online. Um, you know, explaining the story of the background of the sake, of the brewery. I think all that contributes to, to the purchasing journey and, and the, uh, um, the, the, the purchasing interest of the client. Um, and of course, you know, we, we try and present um, you know, the, the sake as best as we, as we can uh, in terms of you know, visual, uh, you know, photography and design. Um, so I, I, I think that's, that's quite a bit of an interest uh, 
that has helped. Um, and one of the actually one of the successful things that we've implemented in the last couple of years is actually the introduction of packages. So we've put oh. together, you know, you know, two or three bottle packages together, and I think that helps consumers to. Um, uh, it, it helps them to make a decision uh, a little quicker. Was this with help uh, by the, uh, the sake brands or you know, it's just an initiative on your own? Yeah, no, it's, it's something we did on our own. I mean, it started with, uh, you know, it started with putting the same brand together. For example, you know, we'll put the, mm. the Jumai Daiginjo and the Daiginjo together. Obviously, we, you know, we give a package price to the customer. So it started with that. And then we tried putting several different brands together. And uh, so the feedback that we got from customers was they actually enjoyed it. They enjoyed it um, for two reasons. One is it kind of took their decision making away from them. Uh, and secondly, uh, it was also nice because what we had done was, for example, a certain range was to have three different rice. Uh, you know, so all the same grade, but three different rice, three different regions. Um, and from that, they could have almost their own little tasting flight at home. Yeah, I agree. It's a... Uh... Is that is that age old uh, saying? You know, um, no choice is a good choice, right? <laughs> In a way, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I can fully appreciate that. Um, so, do you think that the F and B scene has has recovered? I mean, we're in twenty twenty two. How long can this last, right? I, I I don't know if recover is the if is recover is the appropriate word to use. Uh, I just from from observation, I think it, it's not as bad as it was. Uh, right at the beginning of 2020 um, but uh, I mean it's not I, th I think for majority of the people that have managed to survive uh, it's not all doom and gloom I think I think or at least I can speak for my customers is I think they've identified their their customer base they've taken care of them very well and, and in return, their customer base, you know, has rewarded them with their loyalty. Um, and, uh, and I think the interesting thing is actually the change of the customer uh, behavior for, for the restaurants, at least. Um, I think they're coming in earlier now. I, it's not uncommon for people to come in at like 6 or even 5.45 to have a couple of pre-dinner drinks and then actually start their meal at, at 6.30 because two things, you know, some restaurants you've you got to kind of leave by about 8 or 8.30 so that they can have a second turn or otherwise they start early because they know that by 10.30, you know, most restaurants will, will close. Once they can't serve alcohol, they close. So by 10.30, they close. So it gives them that good four or five hour window to, to, to get a nice comfortable meal in. Uh, whereas in the past, people will walk in at 7.30 or 8 because they know they can sit till, you know, 12.30, 1 o'clock and not be an issue. Yeah, yeah, that, that is quite true. Um, again, for, for foreign listeners who are listening in, the, um, the current regulations that we have in Singapore is that you have to end your, your service or, you know, your drink service by, by 10.30. So it's not now. And uh, we just had a revision in terms of the number of... Um, patrons that you can have at the table that's five mm -hmm. yeah, that's five so we're taking baby steps but I think you know we're slowly improving or well, the, the situation can, can can be far better but you know with the recent and this is this is um, this is now that, that, that I'm, I'm I'm actually bringing this up that uh, the the surge in Omicron's um, numbers are you know are just doubling up tripling up uh, I think we are last night was what 16,000 16, yeah yeah so we're in the five yes. we're in the five digits now but but the good good news is that most people are not getting uh, you know very sick you know so I think I think that's that's a silver lining okay that's good that's good to know um, I mean the reason only reason why I'm bringing that up is also because I'm just looking at the recent stats and I, I'm sure you have those stats with you Eugene uh, by export volume in terms of value Right, Singapore actually actually has kind of improved quite a bit, and we are at fourth right now, and just right, you know, just right, hot on the heels of Hong Kong. So I think that's quite encouraging. And if we looked at uh, export amount, um, best improved in terms of percentage, again we're just behind Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is leading the way in, at number one. We're number two. So I think this is all very encouraging numbers. Um, I do see that Singapore probably would be. 
the one to watch for in terms of uh, a sake battleground, you know, in um, whether it's in terms of distribution, more more competition for you, Eugene. I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure. Um, but yeah, but how how do you see that? How do you see that um, taking form in the next, say, two to three years? Well, definitely better choices, better sake for our Singapore consumers. So, you know, I I think I speak for for the industry that you know we want to uh, present the best possible experience, both in terms of product and quality of product uh, to our customers, both through restaurants and, and direct. So I, I think all this is definitely good for, for the customer. Um, so happy to contribute and be a part of that. Yeah, okay, well, that's a very positive take on it. You know, at least you don't see it as competition. Um, I do have, actually have one other uh, topic that I would like to bring up. Um, because we, since we're talking about numbers, sure. do you think parallel imports are hurting the market? Oh, that's a that's a that's a real tricky question. Um, I don't think. Well, I mean, it's it's good for the consumer because you get a wider range of of products that stuff that normally wouldn't be here. So in that respect, that's pre- that's pretty cool. But the other question would be obviously the the question of provenance uh, handling. Um, how well it was taken, how many people are there in the chain. Mm. Um, and by the time it gets to to the final customer in Singapore, sure, you've got a bottle, it looks nice, it's it's cold when you got it, but we don't know, we have no clue where, where it has been and how it's been handled uh, between the brewery and yourself. Yeah. So, so I think that's, that's where it gets a bit tricky. And I think the... The difficult thing for a brand or for a customer is at that point where you receive this bottle that you may have paid a significant amount of money from, there is that chance where you open it and it may not meet your expectations. It may not it might be disappointing, right? Exactly. Something may have gone wrong. And it's very tough at that point for you to think, oh yeah, someone along the line didn't take care of it. So, but because the first thing you think is, oh, no, I tried brand X, I paid X amount of money for brand X, and it tasted horrible. So brand X is bad. I think that's where that's where it gets tricky, and, and that's where it gets difficult, and to a certain extent, not fair to the brewery. Yeah, it's, you're right. I think it's uh, taken out their hands. M- most consumers would not be have that uh, education in terms of, yeah, it's probably probably parallel import, uh, and nobody really took good care of it. I'm gonna give the brewery another chance. Yeah, and you know, and, and on the flip side, most breweries, from what I've heard, don't actually know how their the the products are actually you know getting into market. Right. Yeah. Rock so ten. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one that's one channel. Um, I, I mean, it's. It, I mean, I know this is just a conversation, but you know, who are we? How, who are we to, to to criticize on that matter? Uh, it's a good point that you actually brought up that it's it's positive that the consumers are getting sakes um, readily but you know, without provenance that, that, that throws everything up in the air right. Right? there's a lot of other things to consider like brand dilution and um, you know brand representation does it is this what the brand is you know offering right. and, and of course I mean unfortunately for, for certain brands um, by the time it's you know handed through multiple parties and it ends up at your, your table, uh, it's, it's now several multiples of, of uh, price of what it originally was, yeah. which makes it very tricky. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's good, it's good that you recognize it. I think it's good that all of us recognize it. But um, I think the fact of the matter is, do you think this will, this will be eradicated in time to come? Or do you think this is something that's here to stay? How do I say that we're not we're not getting in trouble? <laughs> uh, well, well, it is streaming, but it, uh, you know, let's let's try to, let's try as, as be as diplomatic as possible as we well, can. Di- diplomatically, I mean, let's let's be honest, it's not illegal. Yeah. So no one's breaking the law. So if you take it from that respect, you know, mind your own business, right? I mean, look, the, our, look, <laughs> look, look at our look at our automobile business in Singapore. Yeah, exactly. Right? I was going to bring that it's up. It's celebrated by by our economy, right? So. 
<laughs> the PI economy is is uh, is encouraged in Singapore, so it's unfair to look at one one product and say you can't do it, another product you can. Again, from a legal perspective, but from you know from a purity of uh, a, a sake fan for someone who works directly at breweries who who puts in a lot of effort to uh, to ensure that our customers get the best product possible. Um, it gets it gets hard to it gets hard to champion you know the the parallel uh, market because knowing again the the amount of of effort and trouble that, that we put into to keep our products in in a good condition and to get them to our customers at a at a reasonable price i think um i think it's also very difficult to to manage expectations when for example I can offer you brand A at, at uh, I'm just using an arbitrary number at a, at $100 and someone else is selling brand B at $300 and if you don't know either of them want the $300 must be the better one of course right? yeah, because I mean, it's easy to equate quality with price that is true but since since you know back to the topic of PI and would you expect a PI product to be lower than the one that's from the original distributor not not for luxury products which i believe which i would classify pi sake as under hmm. Hmm. that's true yeah well that's that's a good point yeah it's it's a very hotly contested topic i think and and if i was to give my two cents i don't think this will ever end uh it's it's it's, it's a sad reality, but I, but if there was any chance that that um, such a practice is being reduced, uh, it would take everyone's efforts. I think even even largely on the on the breweries and to be firm on certain um, export channels and and you know if they are doing any form of tracking. Um, maybe for sake's in, for sake's case. Uh, it hasn't come to the stage of where wine has. Uh, not, I'm not talking about in terms of popularity. I'm talking about in terms of problems that it might face. Um, for example, fraud, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of people don't tend to see that issue with, with um, drinks fraud. Not yet. <laughs> well, not yet, exactly. But once sake comes to maturity, you know, it comes to its own. And people start to see value in it, and fraud becomes an issue. I can totally see. Mark my words. I think this might actually manifest itself uh, in later days. I'm not sure it will, will I see in my lifetime, but you know, we ne we never know. Do you think that would be an issue? I think if the if the education is out there to the the market, where. Uh, where it's important to pay attention to again to, to provenance to knowing the the I'm not sure the correct term you know the, the chain of transport and logistics from the brewery and if the customer can be assured um, that at least they know where the sake has come from and where it's been uh, I think that would be very helpful uh, as far as I'm aware I think there are a couple of companies that are experimenting and trying to implement uh, a system like this and uh, you know hopefully this uh, can come into play um, at some point uh, and, and, and help at least at least we give the customer the the confidence to know that okay this product uh, whichever brand it is this product is is it, it has a clear provenance we know where it's from right and this second product we don't know and then the customer can make that decision on which one they would rather they would rather uh, purchase, uh, and let let that decision be on the customer. Yeah, I think you're quite right. Um, but for them to make that decision, I think they still need to kind of be informed and at least educated to a certain level. For sure. Yeah. Uh, well, it is encouraging. I mean, if we if we were using our school stats, more and more people are actually getting themselves uh, equipped with that kind of knowledge. So hopefully, more and more people would. Um, be a little bit more aware 
uh, do listen to this podcast. You know, it will help. Uh, it will help boost up your your knowledge, I suppose. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess Don't we listen to me. <laughs> well, we have to listen to him. Listen to Sean. <laughs> oh, we, you know, we listen to all the all the professionals out there. Uh, and I, you know what? I think on that note, I think it's a good time to probably wrap up our first episode. You know, Eugene, it was fantastic having you on 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 show. And this is a bit of a. Um, it's a bit of a catch up since our time on this future uh, Saki Future Summit, right? It was what, a year, was it a year, a year and a half ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we did that over It was online, yeah. yeah. it was over Zoom. I think it was quite it was quite uh, it was quite fun, you know, to, 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 to be part of a project like that. Um, and now we're kinda of doing our own thing. So hopefully we we'll, we'll expect you to, to come back more often. If you have me, yes. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We know where you know you are a busy man, so we'll try our best to, to get you on, uh, you know, back here, in the recording studio. Okay. Uh, so if you like to listen to more of such drinks content, please do remember to follow and subscribe to our channel. Uh, and we all look forward to seeing you at the next episode. And remember, a drink always tastes better when the company clicks. Come by. Come by and uh, uh, smash the like button. Yes, smash the like button. Are we allowed to toast now? Whoa, we can't really toast in this context. But yeah, we'll see you soon. Take care.